In this episode of the Nurse Practitioner Podcast, Dr. Jody Allen and Dr. Scarlett R. Spain discuss the pathophysiology of pain. What is the significance of understanding the pathophysiology of pain? Understanding the pathophysiologic processes associated with musculoskeletal pain is important because it is the cause of an overwhelming number of healthcare visits each year. The United States specifically noted that in 2016, one in two adults over the age of 18 reported musculoskeletal pain, which is the same number of patients with cardiovascular and chronic respiratory diseases combined. Musculoskeletal pain contributes to a patient's ability to work, loss of independence, and disability over time. Costs of diagnostic testing, along with treatment for musculoskeletal pain, are exorbitant. As the U.S. population ages, these costs will continue to rise. Delayed identification of some diagnoses can lead to chronic pain, permanent disability, or even death. It is imperative that a nurse practitioner has an appropriate understanding of the pathophysiology of musculoskeletal pain so that they can navigate this common complaint in a safe, cost-effective, and evidence-based manner. In relation to headaches, it is important to understand the pathophysiologic processes associated with primary headache disorders because the prevalence of headache disorder is estimated to affect up to 50% of the global population. The three main types of headache disorders are tension type, cluster, and migraine. And these diagnoses are the most common syndromes of the nervous system. Recurrent headaches, whether migraine, tension, or cluster headaches, are associated with decreased quality of life, financial burden, and increased levels of disability. In fact, headache disorders are the third leading cause of years plus disability. Understanding the pathophysiologic processes involved in each of the three headache types will help guide the nurse practitioner in making an accurate diagnosis and providing the appropriate treatment. While there are similarities in the pathophysiology of pain related to headache syndromes and musculoskeletal pain, can you explain the inherent differences between the pain felt in a muscle or joint as compared to the pain felt with a headache? The pathogenesis of musculoskeletal pain is varied and dependent on the anatomical structure or structures affected and the mechanism of injury sustained. For example, strains and sprains of supportive musculoskeletal structures, particularly ligaments and tendons, are some of the most common types of injuries that lead to the complaint of musculoskeletal pain. Since these are structures that facilitate movement, they are often torn, ruptured, or fully separated from the bone at their attachment point. The pain felt is related to the inflammatory effects produced by the injury. The same inflammatory effects cause the pain related to overuse injuries such as tendonitis or bursitis. Neck and back pain are often the result of sensory or motor dysfunction, causing pain, functional, and neurological deficits. Neck pain itself is often associated with the pathogenesis of headache. Different from musculoskeletal pain, headaches often are caused by complex neurological processes that affect multiple areas and functions of the brain, and quite frankly, in some cases, the causation of the pain is not very well understood as in the case with cluster headaches. Explain the similarities and differences of the clinical manifestations patients report with musculoskeletal pain and headache pain. The clinical manifestations of musculoskeletal pain can vary based on the site or sites of pain and the underlying injury sustained. A nurse practitioner must be skilled in their subjective information gathering to identify clinical manifestations that occurred during injury, immediately following it, and as the pain has progressed to the time of their visit with the nurse practitioner. For example, asking the patient if there was a popping or cracking sound heard at time of injury, was there swelling to the joint at time of injury or immediately after, was and is there an ability to bear weight, are there positions that are more painful, and how has the swelling or pain improved or worsened since their injury occurred. Patients may or may not report identifiable deformities to the site of pain. Edema and ecchymosis are commonly reported. Pain with musculoskeletal movement, decreased range of motion, and decreased strength are frequently described. There are red flag manifestations related to musculoskeletal pain that should be identified swiftly to prevent permanent disability. These red flag manifestations in the assessment of the general musculoskeletal system include hot and or swollen joints, systemic symptoms such as fever, focal or diffuse weakness, neurogenic pain, claudication, unrelenting nighttime pain, poorly localized pain, and a recent joint procedure or surgery or pain caused by a major traumatic injury. It bears mentioning that diagnostic imaging is not often indicated for musculoskeletal pain unless there are absolute indicators identified. 
These indicators include when an examination cannot localize the anatomical structure causing pain or symptoms, after significant trauma, when there is loss of joint function, when fracture or bone infection is suspected, and or when the patient has a history of malignancy. Radiography is nearly always unrevealing for most patients with new and acute pain to the back and or soft tissues and therefore not indicated. While CT has shown usefulness in evaluation of axial skeletal pain and MRI in the evaluation of soft tissue disorders and spine disorders, these two come with a great monetary cost to patients and the overall healthcare system. This is an important concept for nurse practitioners to understand so as to negate unnecessary radiation exposure and decrease costs to treat musculoskeletal pain. The American College of Radiology developed appropriate use criteria to be identified by all providers ordering a CT or MRI for Medicare patients by January 1, 2020. Appropriateness criteria utilizes evidence-based guidelines to assist providers to make the most appropriate imaging decision based on the condition or pain presented and assessed. The American College of Radiology provides a useful website for nurse practitioners to aid in their determination of need to order specific diagnostic imaging, presenting recommendations and the best available evidence to ensure appropriateness of diagnostic testing. Each of the three headache types have different clinical manifestations that help the nurse practitioner differentiate which headache syndrome the patient may have. Migraine headache is described as a unilateral, throbbing pain of moderate to severe intensity which may worsen with activity and generally last 4 to 72 hours. Migraine will also be associated with at least one of the following, nausea and or vomiting, photophobia or phonophobia. Migraine may also occur with aura. Migraine aura generally occurs within the hour before the headache begins. It may include temporary vision changes such as blind spots, zigzag lines, flashes of lights, or shimmering. Other disturbances such as numbness, speech, or language difficulty or muscle weakness may be present. Cluster headaches occur unilaterally and are described as an excruciatingly severe, stabbing, and throbbing type of pain. Cluster cycles are the period of time during which attacks occur and can go on for days to months. The attacks themselves can occur from once daily up to eight times daily and often occur around the same time each day. Pain is generally most intense in the mid-face and teeth due to unilateral trigeminal distribution. The severe pain may also present with autonomic manifestations, which may include peering of the eye, ketosis, or nasal congestion. The primary characteristic of a tension headache is the sensation of a tight band or pressure around the head. The onset of pain is gradual and typically classified as a mild to moderate bilateral headache. Episodic tension type headaches usually will last for a few hours but may persist longer. Can each of you discuss the treatment options for patients with musculoskeletal pain and headache syndromes as it relates to the pathophysiology of each disease process? Treatment of musculoskeletal pain is, again, specific to the underlying cause of the pain and is considerably varied. There are some generalizations in treatment that highlight the goal of decreasing the inflammation associated with injuries as the cause of musculoskeletal pain. The acronym PRICE is invaluable in the effective treatment of musculoskeletal pain or injury, particularly sprains and strains of muscles, ligaments, and tendons. P stands for PROTECT and R stands for REST the affected part of the body. I stands for ice, which should be applied for 48 hours. C stands for compress the site of pain or injury, such as with an ACE bandage. And E stands for elevate the affected part of the body if able. These five activities can minimize bleeding at the site of injury and or pain. Use of ice alone for periods of 15 to 20 minutes at intervals of 30 to 60 minutes has been shown to significantly minimize the inflammation and accelerate regeneration of the muscle fibers injured. Limiting the patient's activity by immobilizing the painful joint is appropriate and promotes healing by regenerating the muscle fibers. But this should not be a time for complete immobility as this can increase the risk of re-injuring the muscle once mobile again. Pain relief is important regardless of the underlying cause of musculoskeletal pain. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, or NSAIDs, are the first-line choice for pain relief related to musculoskeletal causes. NSAIDs are available over-the-counter, such as ibuprofen or naproxen, and can be prescribed at higher doses. 
Long-acting NSAIDs are available by prescription only, such as diclofenac and meloxicam. While there are few controlled studies, there is solid evidence on the positive effects of NSAIDs in successful treatment of pain, particularly for muscle and soft tissue injuries. When NSAIDs are used in the short term during the early stages of recovery, inflammation is diminished without adversely affecting tensile strength or muscle contraction ability. Topical medications, both over-the-counter or prescription, such as capsaicin or Voltaren gel, are viable options for successful treatment of musculoskeletal pain. Opioids are not indicated for acute pain related to a muscle injury and should be avoided. Multidisciplinary interventions in patients with musculoskeletal pain have been found to improve both the physical and mental symptoms that occur alongside the painful muscle or joint. Initiating collaboration with specialty physicians, physical therapists, chiropractors, and exercise specialists early in the treatment can also lead to a quicker recovery. A referral to a pain management specialist may be required if the patient needs long-term pain treatment. The nurse practitioner is certainly equipped to be the leader of this interprofessional team. Lifestyle changes can help to reduce the frequency or severity of headaches. Patients should be taught to keep a headache journal to self-reflect on their individual triggers, such as lack of sleep, certain foods, stress, or even medication overuse. For migraine, avoiding triggers is an important component to management. Stress management and lifestyle changes can also reduce the incidence of migraines. Medications used for acute treatment of migraine headaches include non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, tryptans, dihydroergotamines, opioids, and antiemetics. A wide variety of preventative medications are also available for use and include beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, tricyclic antidepressants, anti-seizure medications, injection of botulism toxin A, and CGRP monoclonal antibodies. Also, cognitive behavioral interventions to reduce insomnia and behavioral interventions focused on relaxation training and stress management have proven successful for some migraine sufferers. When looking at cluster headaches, Acute treatment includes oxygen and use of subcutaneous or intranasal tryptan. Other treatments available for acute cluster headache include intranasal lidocaine, oral ergotamine, and intravenous dihydroergotamine. Preventative therapy includes mill used daily. Other medications including sodium valproate, topiramate, lithium, and melatonin have been shown to help with prevention of cluster headaches in some studies. Tension type headaches may be treated effectively with ice and non steroidal anti inflammatories as needed. Patients experiencing chronic tension type headaches may benefit from daily use of a tricyclic antidepressant, behavioral and relaxation therapy, or injection of botulism toxin A. Musculoskeletal pain and headache syndromes are in the top 12 list of diagnoses billed in primary care. So, can you speak a little bit about billing for these disorders? The ICD-10 is the standard billing code system that is used to submit diagnosis codes for insurance reimbursement. ICD-10 coding for musculoskeletal pain are composite codes that express the area of musculoskeletal pain with the highest specificity preferred. These highly specific ICD-10 codes will identify the side of the body affected and the joint or joints affected, ensuring the most appropriate diagnosis and billing for each patient. Injuries are grouped by anatomical site versus injury category. Codes have been expanded for injuries to capture further specificity, and laterality has been added to ensure a complete picture of the appropriate diagnosis. The ICD-10 code M79.6, the root code for pain in limb, hand, foot, fingers, and toes, is submitted for individuals that present with musculoskeletal pain in any of those areas. The nurse practitioner can then increase specificity by adding additional numeration to represent the distinct area of pain. For example, if a patient presents with pain in their right arm, then submit code M79.601. If the patient presents with pain in their left toe or toes, then submit code M79.6. Supportive information within the chart will provide justification for highly specified and correct coding. The code with the highest specificity will increase reimbursement. The ICD-10 CM diagnosis code for headache is R51 and can be used as a diagnosis for reimbursement purposes. Migraine headaches are listed under the ICD-10 CM code starting with G43. 
Other headaches, such as cluster headache and tension type headaches, are classified with the code G44. Supportive information documented within the patient's chart provides justification, specificity, and correct coding, which increases reimbursement. What is the nurse practitioner's role in managing patients' complaints of pain? The role of the nurse practitioner in the management of musculoskeletal pain is exhaustive. The nurse practitioner is completing assessments, ordering labs and diagnostics, treating with pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic modalities, educating patients, coordinating care, following up, and billing for reimbursement of care and performance measurement. Nurse practitioners excel at holistic patient evaluation to ensure rapid identification of stressors that can impede the success of treatment and prolong disability related to musculoskeletal pain. Nurse practitioners are proficient in maintaining cost-effective treatment plans, a key to reduce the economic burden for patients with musculoskeletal pain and the healthcare system as a whole. Nurse practitioners encourage patients with musculoskeletal complaints to be active in the care of their pain, and this has shown positive results with treatment adherence and a more rapid return to usual activities of daily living. In regards to headache, the nurse practitioner must first complete a thorough physical exam and history and rule out any red flags or emergent causes for the patient's headache. This will include the onset, timing, duration, and severity of symptoms, and also note a thorough history, including the presence of environmental or other known risk factors for headache syndrome. The nurse practitioner must also be cognizant of secondary causes of headache. Sometimes the diagnosis of headache may require imaging as either emergent or non-emergent status. The nurse practitioner must be aware of when these orders are transferred to an emergent setting should take place. As far as managing the patient's complaints of pain of primary non-emergent headache, there are many medications available that can be used on a PRN or scheduled basis. Sometimes it may take a couple tries to get good control of the patient's pain, but there are many options. As mentioned previously, this condition can be extremely disabling to people, so our role as nurse practitioners is to try to eliminate or control the headache episodes in a safe and effective manner for the patient. This podcast does not constitute medical advice and should not be taken as such, and does not replace professional judgment or advice. The ideas and viewpoints expressed in this podcast do not reflect the official position of the speakers, authors, affiliated organizations, the Nurse Practitioner Journal, or Walters Kluwer.